Hey everyone, this lesson is all about fructose metabolism. So we're going to get into the basics of fructose. Uh, what are some of the dietary sources of fructose? How our body actually absorbs fructose? And then how our body actually metabolizes fructose? And then finally, we're going to talk about some of the health impacts with regards to fructose metabolism. So what is fructose? Well, fructose is a hexose carbohydrate or sugar, and it is a monosaccharide. Now, here is a Haworth projection of fructose, and here is a Fisher projection of fructose for reference. Now, what are some of the dietary sources of fructose? Well, uh, one of the dietary sources of fructose comes from fruits. Um, fructose is also known as the fruit sugar. But some of the more unhealthy dietary sources of fructose include high fructose corn syrup and fructose as a component of sucrose. Um, and again, sucrose is simply glucose fructose disaccharide. Now, why is this all important? Well, it's because there have been recent research findings to suggest that there is an association between high fructose intake and the onset of obesity, diabetes, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And we'll get into talking about why this may be occurring. So whatever dietary source we get our fructose from, it has to be digested into free fructose. Now, if it's in the form of sucrose, we actually enzymatically break it down um, with the enzyme sucrase into free glucose and free fructose. I'll talk about the digestion of sugars in another lesson. Nevertheless, when we have free fructose, it is actually absorbed from the intestinal lumen into an intestinal endothelial cell through the GLUT5 transporter. Now, once it's in the endothelial cell in the intestine, it is actually transported out through GLUT2 into the bloodstream. Now, what's uh, the difference between fructose absorption and glucose absorption in the intestine? Well, when we have glucose, glucose is actually transported into an intestinal endothelial cell through sodium-dependent glucose transporter 1, or SGLT1. But when it's in the uh, endothelial cell, it's actually transported out into the bloodstream using the same transporter, GLUT2, as fructose. Now, once fructose is in our bloodstream, it travels to the liver. Now, the liver is actually the main site of fructose metabolism. So... If we were to look at a microscopic level of the liver, we see the hepatocytes. Now, the hepatocytes actually absorb or uh, transport fructose into the hepatocyte through GLUT2 as well. Now, we're talking about GLUT2 a lot. So what is uh, the difference between GLUT2 and the, some of the other glucose transporters? Well, some of the important things to realize about GLUT2 is that the biggest one that I want you guys to remember is that GLUT2 is uh, insulin independent. It does not require insulin to actually transport glucose or fructose. It also has a high Michaelis-Menten constant, which means it has a low affinity. So it only absorbs glucose or fructose when those uh, levels are actually very high. And GLUT2 is present in the liver, pancreas, and intestines. Now, having said that, fructose is almost entirely absorbed and processed and metabolized in the liver. So once fructose is brought into the liver, it is actually phosphorylated with the enzyme fructokinase. Now, fructokinase is only present in the liver. This enzyme is irreversible, and it requires an ATP. Now, this enzyme is actually regulated by uh, the transcription factor, carbohydrate response element binding protein and there's been recent research to suggest that uric acid will actually upregulate carbohydrate response element binding protein to actually upregulate this enzyme. Now once we have fructose 1-phosphate it actually gets cleaved um, by the enzyme aldolase B into dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde. Now, dihydroxyacetone phosphate is the same as the one that's also in glycolysis, but the glyceraldehyde is different. Now, the glyceraldehyde has to go through another step using the enzyme triose kinase to form glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is the, uh, the product we get from glycolysis as well. Now, dihydroxyacetone phosphate can be processed as well into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, uh, via the enzyme triose phosphate isomerase. 
once we have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, it can go through the rest of the glycolytic pathway um, to phospholenol pyruvate and then be uh, actually processed into pyruvate by the enzyme pyruvate kinase. Now, showing you the fructose metabolism portion of the pathway, the beginning steps of the pathway, how is this different from glycolysis? So uh, this part of the pathway we call fructolysis. Anything that's metabolism of fructose is fructolysis, just like glycolysis. So with glycolysis, the first difference is obviously hexokinase. Hexokinase is the first enzymatic step in glycolysis, and it phosphorylates glucose 6-phosphate. Now, hexokinase does have some slight affinity for fructose and can actually phosphorylate fructose, but it, uh, again, has a very low affinity. So most of the enzymatic processing of fructose is fructokinase. Now, once we have glucose 6-phosphate in the glycolytic pathway, it can be processed to fructose 6-phosphate, and then fructose 6-phosphate goes through another enzymatic reaction with phosphofructokinase 1 to form fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now this is the absolute essential thing to remember from this, is that fructolysis, the metabolism of fructose, skips this step. It can actually go around the phosphofructokinase 1 enzymatic reaction. And this is critically important in metabolism because this enzyme, phosphofructokinase 1 or PFK1, is highly regulated. It's regulated by things such as fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. It's upregulated by or activated by AMP. It's inhibited by ATP, inhibited by citrate, and inhibited by hydrogen ions. So it is activated by energy deplete states, and it's inhibited by energy uh, surplus states, such as ATP and citrate. So this is a critical uh, juncture um, in glycolysis, which is absent in fructolysis or fructose metabolism. So in the glycolytic pathway, once we have fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, it can undergo cleavage by aldolase into dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and then both, um, both pathways, uh, fructolysis and glycolysis, can continue using the glycolytic enzymes until it forms pyruvate. And pyruvate kinase is negatively regulated by glucagon. So there is some slight regulation at the end of the pathway. However, PFK1 is one of the most highly regulated enzymes in this process. And because fructose or uh, fructose metabolism or fructolysis actually skips this enzymatic step, fructose metabolism is almost unstoppable. It is has very little regulation. It has very little regulation on its transport into the liver as GLUT2 is insulin independent. It has very little regulation in the beginning steps of fructose metabolism. There's no PFK1 step in fructose metabolism and it has only very little regulation at the end of the pathway with pyruvate kinase. So now that we know that there's very little regulation on fructose metabolism like there is with glycolysis, I'll show you why this is very concerning with regards to health outcomes and with regards to obesity and diabetes uh, specifically. Now again, fructose is first acted upon by fructokinase in the liver to form fructose 1-phosphate, is then cleaved by aldolase B to form dihydroxyacetone phosphate in glyceraldehyde. Dihydroxyacetone phosphate can be processed into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate with the enzyme triose phosphate isomerase, and then uh, glyceraldehyde itself can also be converted into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate with the enzyme triose kinase. We all know this um, so far, and we know that this leads to the end product pyruvate. So I've shown you that fructose can be formed into pyruvate, but I never showed you what happens after. Well, what happens is that pyruvate gets processed by pyruvate dehydrogenase to form acetyl-CoA. Because there's no regulation on fructose metabolism, or there's very little regulation on fructose metabolism, we get high levels of acetyl-CoA production, and this actually leads to fatty acid synthesis. We produce a lot of fatty acids with fructose. Almost a majority of fructose gets converted to fatty acids. Now, 
with glyceraldehyde, glyceraldehyde can actually be processed by the enzyme glycerol dehydrogenase to form glycerol. Glycerol can then be acted on by the enzyme glycerol kinase to form glycerol 3 phosphate. And then glycerol 3 phosphate can um, also be pro produced from dihydroxyacetone phosphate by the enzyme glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. And then glycerol 3 phosphate in the fatty acid can actually go through an esterification reaction to form triglycerides. So fructose completely can produce triglycerides on its own. So we get we can get large amounts of production of triglycerides in our body simply because there is very little regulation on fructose metabolism. And over time, prolonged unregulated triglyceride production can lead to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and obesity, which then can lead to the onset of diabetes. Anyways, guys, I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching and have a great day.